Hello, hello, and welcome to my thought on Sunday, but today is Monday because I did a Facebook live event last night, um, and those of you who missed it, missed a good laugh. But today, I wanted to talk about fear because I have seen so much fear since uh, London has increased its uh, regulations, and now they're encouraging us to spy on our neighbors. Uh, it's it's not a good atmosphere, and uh, I... Uh, I, I want to talk about the importance of living now and the importance of not wasting so much energy on fear of what could happen when it hasn't. Um, I believe in common sense. I believe in doing what you need to do. Uh, I cannot say that I believe that all the government regulations, I do not believe that uh, it's before 10 that we're going to get the virus and after 10 uh, we're okay. Um, I don't believe that um, that uh, that that we that if we meet seven people we're going to get the virus but if we meet six we're safe. Uh, I think all these things are crazy. However, I do think we need to take proper precautions and we need to keep our hands clean. We need to keep our hands away from our face. And I personally uh, stay away from big crowds. Uh, that's what I'm doing. But I want to talk uh, about, the, about the importance of taking a chance, the importance of not saying, what if this might happen? I have a 92-year-old friend uh, whose name is Sonia, who has surrounded her life with uh, rules. You cannot, uh, she has to eat at a certain time. She has to have a rest at a certain time. She has to have someone there. She gets very upset if they bring her, she lives in a care home, not in a care home, but a very fancy retirement home. If her food isn't just right, if somebody has attitude with her, she complains to the cook and asks that they don't, that they do not come to her room anymore. She, um, she's very, very, has rules about what she can eat. And frankly, uh, I could not live a life like that. Uh, without a few surprises every day, I don't think I would look forward uh, to my life. I don't think I would look forward to my life. Um, she wrote me, and I said to, she was cautioning me about wearing a mask and about uh, staying inside. Her idea is that I should just hide under the bed and stay there until the pandemic is over. And I said, well, I don't do things like that. And she said, when I see a puddle, I don't step in it. And I said... I don't step in it either, but I don't avoid the street because I'm afraid there's going to be a puddle in it, if you can understand the reasoning. And so what I want to tell you is about a couple things that I did. Probably the first thing was because I was too ignorant to know how frightened I should be. But I want to tell you about them because they enhanced my life. They enhanced my life. Um, when I was 48, I got a job in Oklahoma City, and it was a total disaster. Um, and I was overworked and underpaid and finally fired after, I think, something like six months. And there I was in Oklahoma City. I had sold my home uh, in Toledo, which was a mobile home. I had sold it, everything in it. I had nothing but but the, the, the things I had piled into my car and my two dogs and my two cats. And instead of dissolving in fear, I had, I, I, I networked until I thought of what I wanted to do with my life. And I had read a book by John Steinbeck called Travels with Charlie. And John Steinbeck had traveled around uh, the country in a, uh, in a camper with his poodle, Charlie. And I thought to myself, and I am a writer, I have a master's degree in journalism. And I thought to myself, well, he's a man, I'm a woman. He has one dog, I have two, and I also have two cats. I can do that. So I wrote Reader's Digest and I got them to agree to read the articles I would write and I made arrangements to travel around uh, Southwest United States. I got a, a fifth wheel trailer which is a uh, it's a camper that usually they carry horses in it that sits in the bed of a truck and I got a GMC truck that was so large uh, that when I drove it it looked like nobody was driving it and I spent the next month learning how to drive the GMC truck and hitch the fifth wheel to the truck. Uh, I had never been camping before. I had no idea uh, what I was getting into. 
but I wasn't afraid. And I set off making as many prior arrangements as I possibly could. And you need to know that we didn't have cell phones then. I got a CB radio so that I could radio if I was in trouble, but I never, ever used it. I never used it. And so it was that I traveled to, to Natchitoches, Louisiana, Arkansas, Galveston, Texas, um, Corpus Christi, where I plugged into the Baptist Church. If you know anything about camping, uh, if you're not in a regular park, you have to plug in uh, for your water and your, uh, and your electricity. And I plugged into the Baptist Church. Uh, and I am, as you all know, not that Baptist. And I said to them, is it all right for me to stay here? Because I wasn't paying anything. And they said, oh, we love happy people. So evidently at that time, I was still, I was a happy person. And I stayed there for a month, Corpus Christi. And then I went to Laredo, where I, I babysat a junkyard. And while I was there, a man came to rob the junkyard. And instead, he crashed into my trailer. And I can still remember... Uh, sitting up, I was not particularly afraid. I was very angry. What was he doing in my trailer? And I it was in the middle of the night, and I, I stood up in, in bed, because that's apart from the door, and I said to him, you leave right now. And he did. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. And then I said to him, and shut the door. And he did. <laughs> Which all goes to show, if you're positive enough, you can make anything happen. But from Laredo, I went to... Uh, I went to Wimberley, Texas, and I stayed there for six months. And uh, no, for six not for six months. Maybe I stayed there for a long time. Three, it was, I think it was six months. And then I drove uh, to California. I did that all by myself. I did that with no one to help me. What from what I know now, I think I would be very hesitant. But at that time, it just never occurred to me that anybody would do anything uh, harmful to me. And no one did. No one did on that trip. I was never harmed. Um, and it was, the point that I'm making is it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. I met wonderful, wonderful people. I learned to take care of myself and take responsibility for myself. And in Wimberley, I lived with a bunch of squatters. I did not understand what they were. But there were people that just took up residence on other people's farms and ranches. And um, we, we would get food from dumpsters. Um, and, and then we would all sit around and play the guitar and sing. Um, and this uh, was a very unusual experience for me because I had never stolen so much as a strawberry, and I still have not. Uh, but I was uh, eating that meal that they had gotten from dumpsters. I didn't ask any questions, but that's where they got it. Uh, because nobody had any money, and I didn't have any money either. And that was the other thing I learned. I lived for two months uh, without um, without having any um, any finances, and I was able to do it. I was able to uh, survive. But the other incident I want to tell you about was when I, after the I moved to California in the 80s with the AIDS crisis, I became aware of the fact that there was danger out there if I was not careful. Uh, and when I was doing comedy, I did comedy at a place called 50 Mason, uh, which was in the middle of San Francisco's Tenderloin, and I, uh, where nobody ever goes. And there's a man named Tony Sparks, a comedian, who said, all you have to do is, when you see somebody coming at you, is throw a round uh, candy, a white candy, up the street, and they'll think it's cocaine, and they'll go running after it. But I didn't do anything like that. But I did walk. I parked in the Tenderloin, and I walked several blocks to my car. I did not expect anything to happen, and nothing ever did. But the big thing that happened to me, the biggest, was when, by the time I was in my late 70s, I was very aware that people were getting hit on the head if they weren't careful. And California is not a safe place. Uh, where I was, it's not a safe place. And the way I went to uh, many of my gigs is I would take BART, which is the uh, underground transit system, and I would, I would drive to a place called Coma, which was about five miles from Pacifica, and then I would take BART, and I would come back to Coma, get in my car, and drive home. And on this particular night, it was after midnight, and I, had, uh, I got to the BART station, and I was on my way to my car, and I stopped at the ticket uh, booth because I, I liked the person that, that was there. I knew them. And I went to say hello. And this man came up and he said, when is the last bus to Pacifica? And of course, after midnight, there were none. And without even thinking, I said to him, I'm going to Pacifica. I'll take you. 
and the silence at that point, you could have cut it. Because I, too, realized that I was going to be alone in the car with a total stranger. Uh, and I was, at that time, about 76, 77. Uh, and the, the ticket man was, uh, was horrified. And the man that I was talking to was also very hesitant. Because he didn't think he dared to say yes, but there was no other way he could get to Pacifica. It was really too far to walk. So I said, uh, I'll take you. And I did take him. And we had a lovely, lovely conversation. And I dropped him, for any of you who are listening from the Bay Area, I dropped him at the Linda Bar Shopping Center. And then I turned around and went back home. And if I hadn't taken him, I would have left a man stranded in the BART station instead of having a very lovely conversation with a very polite, lovely person. And I've often said I would take many, many risks to do the kind thing. Many, many risks to do the kind thing. Uh, and of course, a kind thing in this virus thing is to uh, protect others from you and you from others. So that is a kind thing. And I will do much for kindness. But if I had not taken those risks, I, I wouldn't have had these wonderful experiences that I will never forget and friends that I, I still have today. Um, so I want to end this with a quote that is a cliche. And it says, the, the coward dies a thousand deaths. The hero dies just one. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm only going to die one, the time when my heart stops beating. And I want to thank you for joining me for my thought on this Monday, which was supposed to be Sunday.